Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, and we are again. <laughs> we just want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. Amen. As we go once again into that Word, that we might be instructed in righteousness and be more like Him. We are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That, what a wonderful gift that is. Well, we're continuing on in our look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit as the evidence of a redeemed life. If we are the redeemed, first say so. So. <laughs> we are the redeemed of the Lord and we shall say so. But we have to have that evidence in our lives. It's, you know, people can't tell you're a Christian. People can't truly tell you're a Christian because you have a bumper sticker on your car, you go to church on Sunday, or you tithe, or you do this. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit within you, yes. operating within you, in your life, that is the evidence of God's precious, priceless, redemptious, redemption in us. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say it's priceless. No, I know, exa I know exactly price. what the price was, yes. and the price that the Father paid for us was His Son, was his son Christ Jesus. That's, that's quite a price. So we're, we're kind of getting to the end of this portion of the study, looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And in our last study, we were talking about being meek, being gentle, right? And the opposite of that is violence. So that's what we were talking about as we ran out of time in our last session. So we're going to pick it back up there now. But before we do, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you'll ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we just are thankful that you told us in your word about your nature, your fruit, and that you wanted us to have it. And we just thank, we're thankful that we can study it and just put it in our being, put it in our spirit, and just put it in our heart. And let us see how it can grow in us so we can show it to others. And we just thank you and praise you. Amen. 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 Okay. We ended up, with, as I say, we we're talking about meekness, gentleness. Well, we, we talk more, more about violence, though, didn't well, we? Well, because that is the opposite. And you have yeah. to understand, because the, the reason we talked about violence is because we talked in the beginning of last week about how we are to learn God's plan and, and learn from Him. Right. Learn meekness, mildness, gentleness, humility. But we're, we're, we are in, in, but not of, a Such world a that is just, oh my goodness, swamped with violence. Yes. And that's not by accident. Satan has violence in his heart. Yes. And he is trying to cultivate violence in our hearts. Mm -hmm. He is trying to cultivate, for, and he's cultivating that, that violence in people. And that's what we're going to talk about. But you, you've got to understand that we talked. We we're right at the end. We were talking about the fact Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, back in the, like the early 300s, mm -hmm. which to me is the formal institutional church come into existence. Right. And he talked about how he overcame his opponent, another who was, by the way, the Emperor of Rome. Remember, Constantine had been out of the country, um, and it, it was. It was a contest between the two of them as to who would rule Rome. And they were at war with one another. That, by the way, is violence. Mm -hmm. And out of that, Constantine said that he had a vision from God. This is the story. That, that he had a vision from God and God showed him the sign, which was what was the, the Latin cross known as the Chai Ro. And God said to him, in his sign, you'll conquer. So he's saying that God sent him out to, to conquer and kill in the sign of the cross. And I said last week, never has such a great contradiction ever been seen on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Because the cross is the epitome of meekness and humility. And if you don't believe that, go read. And I'm going to read it to you now. Go read Philippians chapter 2, mm -hmm. where it says that we're to have the same attitude in us that was in, the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. All right? That's the epitome of meekness, gentleness. So, the Lord said that we're to listen to His instruction. 
I just want to read you some, some things, verses from the Word, that are His instruction about this. In Psalm, in Psalm 11, 5, it says, The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Mm. Paul wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 4, 5, and said, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. That should be the evidence that we present to people, our gentle spirit. When it comes to the church, Paul wrote that an overseer has to be, and this is a quote now from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. You're not supposed to be contentious. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Titus, that's Paul writing to Titus, as he's telling him to go out and appoint, you know, overseers. Mm. To the leader of Tyre, to the king of Tyre, and this is God speaking, and it's symbolically a picture of Satan, right? In Ezekiel 28, 16, it says, By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Satan is, is the evil of all violence, right? So God continued on and spoke in Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 19, and it says, Then say to the people of the land, Thus says the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the land of Israel, They will eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water with horror, because their land will be stripped of its fullness on account of the violence of all who live in it. Now, my goodness gracious, in the world we live in today, if you believe, if you hear these words of God spoken through that prophet Ezekiel, and you, you consider that God, because he's promising, and he watches over his word to perform it, anxiety and horror when a land is filled with violence. Go back, I read this, I'm going to read it again, Psalm 11, 5. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Uh, you know what? You don't want God hating you, all right? And bear in mind that it's Satan's plan to corrupt, to confuse the language in order to make, to lead mankind away from the plan and purpose of God. That's what he learned at the Tower of Babel. Now bear in mind, he was the, he was the architect of the Tower of Babel. You know, build a tower, you can get into heaven on your own good works or your own works. When God put an end to that, he put an end to it by confusing their language, disa disabling their ability to communicate with one another, right? Satan doesn't want us to be able to communicate with God or with one another. So what he is doing is he is corrupting our language. Think about that. Most now, definitely. I want to go back to those words, meek and gentle, all right? Mm. The world's strong men, the people who are, you know, the epitome that are shown as strong men, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're portrayed in popular movies. They're people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, mm -hmm. Sylvester Stallone, mm -hmm. Jason Statham, Dwayne Johnson, Vin Diesel, mm -hmm. people like them, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's shown. This is, this is a man, right? They're being strong and courageous. Right, because these are men who can kill and destroy with a single angry blow. The Lord instructs us to be meek and to be strong. Mm -hmm. They're not opposites. They go hand in glove and they're dependent on one another. Mm -hmm. In our Western world, where we're continually entertained with violence, yes. and in a world that is submerged in violence at every hand, where terror and death have become commonplace. Every time you turn on the television, the radio, there it is. There's, there's violence, yes. either local or on a world scale, right? right. right. So it should be, because, it, because that's so commonplace, it should give pause to those who belong to God, who were purchased by a willing sacrifice of Jesus at the hands of violent men. Mm. To remember the simple words of James. 
The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. James 1.20 mm-hmm. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. That's not the plan. And yet, so often we seem to think that it is, right? Why do we think it is? Because we're being, we're being conditioned. Satan wants to condition us to accept violence and think of it as a good thing, a tool, okay? One of the most significant prophecies of the coming Messiah, Jesus, came when Isaiah wrote that he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, Isaiah 53, 9. Jesus did no violence, okay? And surely the most perfect example of gentleness is the one who has all power, Jesus Christ, first in the garden, okay? And behold, this is, I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew, Mm -hmm. chapter 26. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. He's defending Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Matthew 26, 51 to 53. Well, best calculation, that's about 78,000 angels. <laughs> You ought to go read in the Old Testament about two angels, two angels showing up and wiping out 183,000 soldiers. I, I've been saying this for a long time. I mean, in, in, in the religion that I grew up in, it seemed to me angels were most often portrayed. They looked like yes. uh, little girls dressed in their prom dresses. Wimpy. Angels. That's, I mean, Zechariah, when he was in the, in the temple... The father of John the Baptist, Zechariah. And the angel Gabriel shows up. And Gabriel says, I'm paraphrasing, he says, Do you know who I am? I stand before God. You know, when you were talking about in the movies how they portray the, the strong, courageous guys, and always when they had anything to do with ministers or people of the gospel, they always came across as very wishy-washy. Wishy-washy and wimpy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's quite because, opposite. Because they, that's what they see as being, well, I guess, weak. I mean, meek. Well, it's because, but Satan is trying to paint that picture. Picture, yes. That following Jesus Christ makes you a, a weak, weak person. Right, right. Okay? Think about when, when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate on trial, and, he's, and Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Mm. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. John 19, 10 and 11. Jesus knew. Remember, he just got through saying, he could in a moment call. call. And did he do that? He chose not to. That's right. And yet we're always looking for more power to destroy enemies? No, no, no. Meekness and Majesty. There's a beautiful song. Meekness and Majesty. That, that is the perfect picture of Jesus Christ. Here you have total meekness, total majesty. You have, you have total surrender and yet total power. Yes. Okay? Jesus did not defend himself, nor did he attack his persecutors. And never was there a greater demonstration of strength. Yes. You see, it was that very fact that seemed to so move the Ethiopian court official who was traveling back home Mm -hmm. after being in Jerusalem seeking to to worship God, right? When he was baptized by Philip. He was reading from Isaiah 53. You know, it it says that the passage of Scripture, I'm reading from Acts chapter 8, verse 32 and verse 35. It says, now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led, talking about Jesus, he was led as a sheep to slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. Mm -hmm. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. True meekness and gentleness requires 
absolute strength of character. A real man is not measured by who he can beat up, but by who he will lift up. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. The command is to act like men and to be strong. And then he continues on in the very next verse and says, let all that you do be done in love. And of course, that would be totally impossible. Hmm. We're not for the last fruit of the Holy Spirit. What's the last fruit of the Holy Spirit? Self-control. Self-control. Or temperance. Or temperance. Temperance in the, in the right. King James, yes. Self-control sounds like something that you can do it. Well, that's the, one of the things I talked about. Self-control is not self-control. Self-control is surrender. But we'll talk about that. Right? But it's, it's interesting. The word temperance, to me, conjures up tempering steel. No, that's, that's not what it is about, though. You ever hear of the temperance temperance movement movement in the early 1900s? Yes, that's the other thing. Um, That was to get rid of um, alcohol. But that's 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 difference between being tempered and having temperance. Yeah, it's it's not it's not the same. Mm. Okay. So temperance is self control. I mentioned the 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 prohibition movement in the early 1900s, led by the prohibitionists. And it was called the temperance movement mm-hmm. because they, were, they basically were trying to do was get people to be have self control and not drink, drink right. by taking the alcohol away from by force. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's helping them. <laughs> well, that's because the world doesn't have the fruit of the Holy right. Spirit. That's the only answer they had. They don't have. You can't. A zillion times I say this. You cannot expect righteous, righteous behavior from, from unrighteous, unrighteous people. people. So you can't expect, you know, it's nice. We can go out, we, we, there are moral codes. Um, red lights are moral codes. Yes. We, we, have, we have an agreement in the community that when you come to a red light, you stop for the safety of all other drivers. Well, I know here in the greater Orlando area, they're making a lot of money because they have red light cameras up and they're fining so many people who run red lights. Yes. Because in the last days, men will be lovers of self and they'll be, all they concern themselves with is their own pleasure, right. their own what's what suits them. So that's the time we need. There's obviously no self control. Mm-hmm. Temperance is the right word. It's just it's not a commonplace word right. anymore. It's Again, not in the language of today. But that's where you see this transition in language, and and part of the problem is, I I truly believe. So yeah. Well, you know. I'm not going to say this in Hebrew. My Hebrew is rusty for sure. Mm-hmm. But there are some things that right in the beginning that you, it would be good if you could learn because I'll show you that God doesn't change. He is not a man that he should change, it says. We were talking about this the other day. It, it's laughable to me. Now, you may say this is because I'm old. No, it's because I'm filled with the Spirit that I can say that I believe the Word of God. I trust the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So when God says, male and female, He created them. That's right. Heinz may have 57 varieties, (laughs) but God doesn't. And we live in a world today where the Word of God is challenged every single moment of time. You know, when I was a kid, we talked about gay, the gay 90s. And they got, well, wait a minute. That doesn't have the same thing meaning at all. No. God gave the rainbow as a covenant yes. between him and man not to be a flag for sin. That's right. I mean, over and over and over. But this is what the devil does because he is a liar by nature and the father of lies. Mm. And he has power in this present world. He has no power over me. He has no power over you. No. And if you have been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, mm. he has no, absolutely no power over you. But you have to remember that and walk in that truth. Mm. Jesus said, listen to that. This is John 15, 4. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. The fruit of the Spirit comes from you in Christ and Christ in you. You can't do this on your own self. Now, there are, there are a lot of paradoxes. I once started a, a website called Paradox. Yeah. <laughs> because there are so many paradoxes in Scripture, right? Uh, a paradox is defined as a seemingly 
self-contradictory yes. statement. Mm -hmm. And that comes from the Greek word paradoxos, which means opposed to existing beliefs. And there are so many in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you a couple of examples, all right? Mm -hmm. In 2 Corinthians 12.10, and this is a good one, mm -hmm. Paul said, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, mm -hmm. with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then yes. I am strong. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 12, 10. Is that a paradox? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's key to what we're talking about when it comes to meekness and self-control. When Jesus was going to, to see Lazarus, uh, encounter Lazarus, hallelujah, when he got, you know, he, when he gets to the to before the tomb, he meets Lazarus' sister, Martha. And he said to her, because she, you know, she goes on, if you were only here, if you were only here, if you hadn't uh, messed up, <laughs> if you'd only been here, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Mm, paradox. Well, that is contrary to popular belief, to common belief. I'll tell you what. We can't be killed. And you know why you can't be killed? Because you already died. Because it's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. You already died once if you've been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb. That's right. So you believe in him, you can't die. Now, in, in that opening verse that I read, right, I quoted Jesus saying a branch only bears fruit because it's attached to the vine. Right. And saying that we cannot bear fruit unless we abide in him. It's not the branch that's responsible for the fruit, but the vine. And Jesus continued on there, and in John 15, 5, the next verse, he said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Get that through your head right now. Apart from him, Amen. you can do nothing. Absolutely true. Because when you start to think that you can do it, you'll start to lean on your own understanding, which we are commanded not to do, and you will start to rely on your own resources, which will be your own strength. Yes. And, and, you, will will, and you will fail miserably Absolutely. but what you will do is you will turn to the world for the world's tools mm. since God has you're, you're, what you're doing is rejecting what God has supplied yes. you with right. and you will you will start turning away from the fruit of the spirit and going back to the deeds of the flesh mm. and that will always lead to violence mm. so the self that appears in self-control right. as a fruit of the Holy Spirit is a paradox in almost all translation it seems to be you know, that's what you get. It's self-control. But apart from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there can be no self-control that enables us to live the new lifestyle that bears evidence of our new life. Think of what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. In the wonderful words of that old hymn, I Surrender All. Amen. That was written by Judson Van Deventa. There's an underlying confidence in those words of Paul. When I am weak, then I am strong. That's an assurance of the truth. When I surrender all, I gain all. Mm -hmm. He expresses the fullness of that when he writes to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 3. Think about what Paul is saying here. Starting at verse 7. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings 
being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay. When you give up everything, when you surrender all, That's when you give up all your own power, when you give up all your own self-control, and give God control, then you know his power in your life. This is the glory. He knew the truth of Jesus saying, so then none of you, none of you, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Luke 14, 33. What's your most prized possession? Look in the mirror and you'll see it. That's right. So. That's, that's, that's human nature. The most prized thing you have is, is yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is why you have to put on that new self. Because otherwise you will join in with the masses in those perilous last days and become a lover of yourself. Mm -hmm. When you surrender all, you will gain all. That's what Paul is talking about. And he's not talking about, this is not hypothetical. This is not theory. This is what Paul lived and he said he walked always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Less is more. A Amen. <laughs> God our Father sent his Son to accomplish all that was needed to provide new and eternal life to whoever would believe and receive. That said, the account of Jesus and his friend Lazarus in John chapter 11 is very, very revealing. Yes. After hearing that Lazarus was sick and then had died... <laughs> Jesus immediately <laughs> waited. Yes. Then, when he gets there, he prayed to the Father, giving him thanks before the miracle. Yes. Gave him thanks before, before the miracle, right. not after. And Jesus stood before the tomb where the stone had been rolled away and cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I am telling you that the Lord is calling us out of, the, out, of, out of the darkness of this world, even right now, even though if you come to new life, it is still always that constant movement into the presence, the arms of Jesus Christ in a greater and greater way. That's what self-control is about. It's, it's giving up all control. Right. Throwing yourself in. You ever see you know, a little child throw himself, fling themselves right. off something and into the arms of the Father? Right. It's, it's trusting in. This is what we talked about, fruit of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, faith, and faithfulness. Right. Our faith is all about trusting in His faithfulness. That if we launch ourselves, He will be there to catch us. That's right. That in like the storm that, that Paul experienced in Acts 27, there's a time to cut loose the lifeboats and place no trust in anything but Jesus Christ, our Lord, who loves us. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you that we can trust in your faithfulness, that we can surrender our control, and then we will have that perfect temperance in our lives, that perfect self-control, because it's your spirit at work within us. Lord, we want to live a life that glorifies you. We want to live a life that is a living daily testimony to your goodness, your love, your greatness, your glory. Father, we thank you that you have given us the power to do that. For when we choose to be weak, when we choose to be meek, when we choose to give up, then we will receive all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Until next time, God bless you and be used for the glory of his name. Amen. I will cling to that old rugged cross and exchange. Thank you.